This is my great pleasure to introduce um, Johannes, uh, Johannes de schmidt um, uh, He's a professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Uh, before that, he was assistant professor at Leiden. Um, and before that, he was postdoc in a bunch of places. So let's not go that, that old. Um, so he has done some amazing, amazing work on the, uh, on the statistical theory of, of deep learning. And today, he's going to talk about the statistic learning in biological neural networks. So it's a little bit different from uh, what he has done before. OK, yeah, floor is yours. Thanks a lot, and welcome to my talk. Um, indeed, yes, sorry. For a couple of years, I was working on trying to understand artificial neural networks from a statistical perspective, right? We have uh, data and we have a method, in this case, uh, deep neural networks that we fit to our data and then so we can build on existing theory and, and mathematical statistics to, to analyze such methods. And um, I think this is by now is a, a big field with many, many papers uh, from also the mathematical community. And I feel we need to move on. And uh, I think one thing that I find particularly interesting are these biological networks, and maybe a bit of a look into the future. So if we, now everyone is busy with AI and, and deep neural networks, but if we see somehow the development over time, then you can, like, if you want to make a guess what is next, then it's probably something that is even more biology inspired than uh, what we have. Now, um, so you see that these, the more these deep neural networks resemble biological networks, uh, the more they, uh, or the better they perform. And so, so if we want to look into the future and already build a theory for, for, for future um, algorithms, then we should probably do something more related to biological networks. Or we can immediately go to these biological networks and see how do they work, actually. Um, so what is now the difference, right? If I tell to my colleagues, okay, before I did artificial networks, now I do biological networks, and oh, this is um, isn't that the same thing, as so, right? Because it's they're yeah, inspired by the brain, so these artificial networks. What's now the, the difference? Now well, the first difference I think is is the brain is this works in some aspects much better than than artificial networks. So for artificial networks, we typically need a lot of data to train them. Think about the self-driving car, for instance, or uh, you need, to, for the autopilot, you need uh, millions of uh, kilometers driven by test driver. And then on, on top of that, you have billions of kilometers from simulated uh, drives. Um, and all that you put together to, to, to uh, learn an autopilot, whereas a human can can learn driving in a couple of, of hours. Right? So, um, that's one thing it also, um, that's also related to this autopilot story, the, these biological networks of the brain at least uh, can uh, generalize uh, very well to new situations that has not seen before. For instance, uh, for autopilot, if you have a new scenery, say a landscape with snow, you need, you need to pick data for that. Um, and it doesn't help you if you have a lot of data from, from drives inside a city to, to, to generalize to, to, to driving uh, in, a, in a snowy landscape. A landscape and so, so the, uh, the human brain can actually easily generalize to that. So also this set GPT or GPT-4 is very impressive and uh, uh, a human doesn't need to absorb the whole internet to, to learn how to how to write a letter or something, right? So, so that's, um, you see that uh, needs much, much fewer data and so there are certain advantages. And so these advantages, this must, it somehow probably has to lie in the different structure and one thing you can see here, so whereas these artificial neural networks, um, they send um, numbers, right? So it just send real numbers to, to the network. One of the distinctive differences for these biological networks is that they, uh, what they send are uh, so-called spike trains. And if you would be a mathematician, or then you would call it a, a, it's a specific uh, point process. Okay, so you have these spike moments, and that generates it is. Uh, potentials or signals, and they send these uh, signals uh, through the network and not numbers. Um, and where is now the information? Well, on the artificial network, the information is in the numbers. Um, and in this biological network, the information is in the moment when it spikes. Okay? So it's, it's uh, the spiking times. And that somehow carries the, the, the thing, and that's um, 
Um, so it, it's different, of course, than an artificial network. So the, the, this idea that artificial networks resemble biological networks, I think it's, it's only true on a very like uh, macroscopic scale as you zoom out uh, and don't look into the details. Um, another thing which makes them different is that these uh, biological networks um, widely believed that they don't, they cannot rely on on, on gradient descent methods. And if you go nowadays to uh, a theory for uh, machine learning workshops, then you see like all the talks basically do something with gradient descent. But I find it quite striking that we have like the original thing we started with these biological networks that they actually don't do gradient descent. And why, why can't they do gradient descent? Well, this is also known as the weight transportation problem. The weight transportation problem is if you would do gradient descent, you would have a formula and based on the gradient. And this formula for look at one fixed one weight. And so then it says update formula for this weight from gradient descent method. And then you can look at this update formula, and you see this update formula will depend on all the other weights in the in the network. Okay, so millions or billions of other weights, and the, the update formula depends on all of them. Um, so it means uh, a neuron, uh, an individual neuron, would need to know what is the value of all the other weights in order to compute this update formula and to, to do gradient descent. Okay, so you, you, you will need to know all this other information and the brain does not have the capacity to exchange all this information. So it's local, it's, uh, you cannot see what the status of the whole network, so it can only do local updates, so it cannot be based on this gradient descent formula. And I just to see that there's nothing special about neural networks, so I just wrote down for the linear model, like the way we write it in statistics in this uh, matrix vector notation. So if we look at, uh, at J, partial derivative with respect to the parameter of interest theta. And then this is basically the thing that is uh, the increment that we add to the to this uh, uh, J parameter in the uh, gradient descent method, right? And if we work it out what it is, well, we can write it like that. And here you see on the right-hand side, even in the linear model that depends on the whole parameter vector theta and not only on the J component of the theta, but if you work out the gradient formula, it depends on the whole vector theta. So, uh, basically, whatever you do with gradient descent, you always need to know the whole state of the uh, of the uh, um, of the model at at that moment. Okay, so you cannot cannot do that, and that's an old uh, thing. Um, here's a, a picture of uh, Francis Crick, who uh, uh, contributed to the uh, discovery of the uh, DNA structure, and later his interests were in, in neuroscience. And uh, when um, backpropagation was hyped in the in the late 80s, and he wrote this commentary in, in Nature, where he says, well, there's a lot of excitement, right? It was a big hype again uh, about these neural networks. And uh, he said, well, this is great, but it doesn't uh, tell us anything about how the how the brain learns because uh, it's not based on on, on gradient uh, descent. Okay, so. It is unlikely that the brain actually uses uh, backpropagation. But um, now um, you can, I mean, there's a lot of neuroscience of, and modeling of, of the brain and so on. I really want to, to make clear here what is the scope of what we do before I come and tell us uh, what, what we have been working on in the past. So the, 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 the scope is really to what I mentioned before, what we did also for this artificial network. We really want to come up with a is we want to understand the brain as a statistical method eventually. Uh, and that means uh, like the first good step is to look at this in a supervised learning uh, framework. We have inputs and we have outputs and have somehow to learn a function that thing by, by, by fitting say a biological network now to the data. And uh, all these things uh, that have been developed in the past six, uh, seven years and the statistical theory for artificial network, that's basically the the, the, the thing we would like to do for the for the biological networks. Yeah, so it's always about a risk bounds for the estimation risk to see how fast the, the convergence rates are. If you if you fit a neural network, how quickly converges does it converge to the to the optimal functions, the optimal target functions, uh, and then there are information static lower bounds to tell us like how good you can 
in principle perform over any method and you want, of course, to show that uh, under which conditions they, they achieve the optimal rate. And so this theory for statistical and the statistical theory for artificial neural networks has also taught us many interesting things. For instance, um, uh, so we know that um, if the target function that we want to learn is uh, what we call now compositionally sparse, so if it has itself somehow a compositional structure, then these neural networks can pick that up much better than other non parametric methods that we knew of before and have analyzed before. And we could really find out, okay, which type of problems uh, where compositional sparsity is likely to occur, neural networks can perform better without run really running any experiments. And these sorts of insights, um, I think that's what we would like to have for the biological networks. And that separates it from many other uh, problems on, on studying biological networks, of course, right? So we, the, the focus is really later on uh, uh, doing this sort of statistical theory. Okay, so that's the, the intro. I hope the, the setting and the motivation is, is clear. Good. So now let me just give you some background. Probably you, you have seen that before on, on heavy and learning. And so, but I think for, uh, I just want to, um, that we're all on the same page, give you a bit of uh, um, background on that. And then I will compare these uh, updating rules in the brain and, and gradient descent. And then if the time permits in the end, I will just briefly talk about uh, other ideas on what could be biologically plausible uh, learning um, and how that uh, is different from what we do. Okay, so let me come to biological network. Again, this is the plot of the biological network with a spike train. There is a mathematician, we would think about it as a, a directed graph, so there's neurons and the nodes, and then they have directed edges, and along these directed or edges, you can send uh, these spike chains. Um, and the spike here, I just take a very simple model of a spike. So uh, it's basically like a potential. So you get the spike and then an exponential decay of the, of the potential afterwards. Um, and then um, as an artificial neural network, we have weight parameters here that connect these, uh, say how strong the connection is between uh, two biological uh, neurons. And uh, they rescale, uh, they rescale the, uh, the the potential. So that's what we get to see the the, the spike multiplied with the with the weight. Um, and so we assume that these weights are uh, um, non-negative. And later, some, uh, actually, we, we I think about the for the theory, I think about the topology to be fixed. It's sparsely connected in the brain, uh, and that these these weight parameters are then, then, uh, positive on the uh, for, for the connected ones. Um, okay, so what is the, the next question is now, what happens actually in, in, in one of these neurons? So how does it compute? But well, it computes its own uh, spike train based on the inputs that it receives, and how does it do that? What is actually the, the transformation? So, so in an artificial neural network, well, a neuron takes the inputs, uh, the weighted input with the weights, and then applies the activation function, out comes the the, the, the number that it sends to its descendants. How is that in a biological network? Well, I'm um, sorry. First of all, again, yeah, so this, sometimes I like to use these neuroscience um, uh, notation on, uh, uh, names. So, it's, so the presynaptic one is the it is, it's a neuron that's, so we fix a neuron and then all the, it gets input from, from another neuron, and they are called the presynaptic neuron, and that neuron that we fix is then called the postsynaptic neuron. So these uh, presynaptic neurons uh, typically they're in the range of thousands, um, but here I just uh, have three of them just to, to illustrate a bit how it works. Uh, they send their potentials to the postsynaptic neurons, and so uh, what happens at the postsynaptic neuron is that it um, superimposes this, these received signals, and at the moment when the superposition exceeds a, a threshold value. Um, it, relates, it releases itself a, a, a spike. Yeah? So that's it. it releases a spike uh, to all its descendants, and that generates the potential at, at all the descendant uh, nodes. And then afterwards, after it has released a spike, well, it goes back to a, a rest potential. Well, here I just put that to, to zero, and then the whole thing starts. Right? It receives uh, spikes and, uh, and, and superimposes that onto it again reaches the threshold, and then it will spike again. And so that is how it generates its um, 
um, its own potential in that sense. Uh, to that sense. So how how can you link that to activation function? Well, I don't really know. Probably the, the best thing is to think about the closest thing is something like a heavy side activation function, zero one activation function. But still, it doesn't. I mean, it's not really comparable. But it's, um, um, so here you see also a big difference between biological networks and artificial uh, networks. Um, okay, is that clear? Because I thought, okay, yeah. If there are questions, just feel free to interrupt me so you can always ask. Um, there's plenty of time. So now what, uh, what is the, the, the learning now? What do we know about the learning? What happens uh, to, like, what is the mechanism that uh, changes the, these weight parameters? Well, um, so it is, um, it's called um, Hepian learning because it goes back to Hep, who in the uh, late 40s um, understood that there's somehow that uh, the, the weights are changed uh, only locally and that only depends on the on the two uh, on the space of the two neurons that are that are connected. So not, nothing else. Um, and so why we like to talk about learning in the neuroscience. We like to talk about plasticity, and so everything that is related to learning will have something to do with, uh, uh, will be named something like plasticity. And what I talk here about is the, the, uh, the, the um, on the, on the, um, really the, 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 the finest uh, rules for, for how plasticity works, and that really um, doesn't integrate over time. Also, there are also these, these, these weight models, but here I really, Really talk about uh, learning rules that um, that depend on the moments when when these neurons spike. So that's called also the, the spike time dependent uh, plasticity. So what matters is how these uh, weights are changed is really on the moments when the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron uh, spike. That's the thing. And so what uh, Hep figured out is in the 40s, like he had a qualitative statement. Well, uh, if they fire together, if they if the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron, if they have basically spike times that are close, then that strengthens these connections that makes the parameters to increase. And if they somehow spike at unrelated times, then that makes these parameters to go down. Um, and so our, uh, that doesn't really help to come up with a learning rule because it's just like, uh, uh, like the principle. But by now, we have much, much better understanding on, on um, uh, the quantitative behavior, how that how that really works, and that's what I want to discuss next. Uh, so here's our uh, yeah exactly yeah. So it will depend on the on the on the spikes, and and that is on on the time. Then yeah. So whenever there's there are spikes, you will see that here on this in this plot actually. So it's also nice because it says the t, so it will go up um, up and down. Yeah. Good question. Um, so here it's, here it's display, and so I took that, actually it's not my plot, I took that from a book, and just added some colors so that it becomes maybe a bit easier to, to follow how it works. Well, there's the presynaptic spike, and there's the postsynaptic spikes. And um, presynaptic spikes are in orange, and so what you see is then whenever we have a presynaptic spike, an orange one here, I should change my color to green, so we have an orange one, then the, the weights, they go down. Okay, Every presynaptic spike causes the, the weight to go down. On the other hand, these postsynaptic spikes, they in, uh, make the weights to go up. Okay, so by how much do they go down, by how much do they go up? And that's a real thing. So the amount by which, uh, for instance, this spike makes the weight to go down is uh, the, the, the potential of the uh, postsynaptic neuron at, at that moment. Yeah, if it has a large potential, it will increase uh, the weight by a large amount. If it's just small, um, then this will not happen. And now the question is, how does that relate to this wire together, wire together idea? Well, you get these large potentials. Um, OK, maybe I, I uh, first explain, when does it go up? Well, it goes up. It's exactly the same thing. So the, the amount it goes up, for instance, here, uh, that is uh, related to the to the potential of the presynaptic neuron if the postsynaptic neuron spikes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So where does that come in? Well, uh, at that moment, we just somehow, there's some underlying mechanism, some, something, it's not clear yet uh, how, how that works. I mean, for the, uh, for the eye, it's like we have uh, neurons that's, uh, that are sensitive to certain parts of our, uh, the, the, the visual field. And if there's some signal, then they, they will somehow release a Poisson process or so to its descendants, and then whole, the whole thing uh, uh, starts. And how the, how the response is incorporated, that's something like, uh, that is, I, I will come to, that, come to that later. But for other areas, like beyond the visual cortex, it's, it's not important also for this talk how, how that actually works. You will, you will see that also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the, the input, yeah, in detail. So uh, for this, um, I, I think I, you will also see later, yeah, so how, how that works, yeah, uh-huh. yeah it comes, comes back later. Uh, uh, good question, yeah. Uh, I, I see that this is, of course, a, bit of, a lot of confusion, but I think over time I, I, I hope to resolve most of that. Um, okay, so I, I tried to, to figure out with this uh, wire together, fire together thing, so you get a, l- a large increase, for instance, this is a large increase, if basically you have an orange spike just in front of the blue uh, spike, that's the thing actually. So it's not that this should be close together. It's really that the presynaptic uh, spike just happens before the postsynaptic spike that makes the weight to, to go up. That's uh, um, so here's a qualitative thing because we can work out what the potential is at a certain moment, right? We I, I mentioned on the earlier slide already what the like the idealized formula for this potential is: this exponential decay. And now we can just work out how big is the bar uh, at a certain moment, and then we we know like by how much it goes up and by how much it goes down. Right? It's a sort of exercise. And here's the the things that I take a, a, a presynaptic spike time called tau, and then we look at the closest uh, postsynaptic spike times uh, t minus and t plus that t plus that happened before and after tau. And depending on that, uh, well, we have some formulas that depend on the on the difference of these of these spike times, and then you have this exponential decay, and uh, that's the amount by what it goes down, and that is the amount by what it goes um, up in the end. Yeah, and then so what I do here, I just put that into into one, uh, not not yet. Uh, so here's again just the formula. Okay, we have a neuron I that sends uh, spikes uh, spike times a neuron J, and then if it has a spike at time tau. Uh, we have an, an decrease um, at the time tau uh, when the presynaptic spikes by that amount, and uh, uh, another one, uh, an increase of the weight um, by, by this amount. And we also have these uh, amplitude functions here that I didn't mention before. Um, they are not really, um, I mean, so much of, of such a big importance here. I will always use just the identity function here. And the whole theory, it will go through whenever um, the A plus and the A minus are the same. It was, I, I will come to them uh, also back later. And there's a bit of a debate if you look at the neuroscience literature whether they're really the same or whether there's a small discrepancy between these two. If there would be a discrepancy, there would be also a decimal term later in the, in the math. But here we assume that they are the same, and we take them to be the identity. That is not very important, but the, the thing that they are the same is a crucial assumption of the whole thing. Um, okay, so we have these, these uh, formulas, and now I just put all that together into one update formula. Okay, so I always put a, there's an increase and there's a decrease, and I, I put them together into one one update. It makes our life a bit a bit simpler. And these all these constants that are, for instance, in the potential. Uh, to simplify the expressions, I just put them to to to, to one. You could, of course, uh, uh, rescale the time or so to um, in order to make them constant. So that makes our life a bit easier. And uh, um, okay, so this is the the the, the thing about um, are these in two individual neurons connected by a spike chain and uh, a weight parameter. How is the weight parameter locally updated? But um, so one question was what was asked before, like 
yeah, where does the, income, uh, the input come from? And the other thing is like, how does it know what it should learn, right? It needs some sort of response uh, from like whether it performed well or not, and based on that, it somehow has to, to, to also incorporate it. Does someone know here how it works with the response? How does it incorporate the response? Okay, so the the idea is um, that um, actually it's our, um, there's a forward pass, right? So we get an input based on that. The biological network uh, goes through all these uh, layers and then makes a prediction about what it believes would be the outcome. It's a predicted outcome based on the um, uh, biological network. And this predicted outcome is compared to the uh, real out uh, the, the, the reality somehow what the, uh, the, the outcome is and um, now based on that um, a reward is computed um, so the reward um, is computed as the difference between a, a say a reward function and a, and a sort of expected reward and that's very important also it's nice that it comes out of the uh, neuroscience literature so that they really recognize that the, the expected reward is important and it's also important for the math later. It helps us a lot that it's really the discounted version and not just the reward. So if you solve a math problem and you expect that you're maybe uh, you're unable to do it and then you, so your expected reward is very low and then you manage to do it, then you get a very, very high reward um, mm -hmm. based on the large difference. If you already do it, uh, you already expect to do it well, then your your brain will give you a little uh, dopamine or any other neurotransmitter uh, because you're somehow anticipated already to do that well. So it's, um, that's the thing. And so there, how it works then is, yeah, so, so uh, the neurotransmitter, say the dopamine is released, and all these neurons that are involved into the learning process, they get to see or they, they, they receive this, this, this neurotransmitter. What does it do? Well, the neurotransmitter causes the, the weight changes to, uh, to increase, to be larger or smaller, depending on what the the value is so it just multiplies the, the amount of weight change. Um, and now you think, well, if I did the math problem correct, although I expected not to do very well, so I get a lot of dopamine, so I should somehow make all of these parameters much larger because that was a success. But that's not what works, right? How it works. It's also if it has a, a negative weight change. This thing will make the negative weight change also makes it larger. So, so, so it just makes it more extreme, the, these weight changes, but it does not make the. So, so I think this common belief is that if you do it successful, then, then you, you, all these connections are strengthened that are involved. Now that's not true. Somehow it's really just a, a rescaling of the, of, the, of the weight changes. Okay, so there's a bit of a problem here with the, with the timing um, because we, we only know the reward after we have done the prediction and this thing, these updates, they happen before we do the prediction. And so that's something, yeah, in this neuroscience that uh, and, and they think there's a small amount of memory or so, which I don't fully understand, but uh, somehow they, they are happy to, to, to write it down and, 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 and that form. And we will work with this with this formula, but I, of course it's clear that there's some, somehow a bit of the discrepancy here. Um, okay, so what we have now, if we incorporate that, we have um, um, this uh, multiplication, multiplicative factor, um, and we also can, and that's also motivated when, I mean, what we know about how the brain works, um, that there should be some sort of learning way that you do a task over and over again. Of course, it's uh, the amount of dopamine that you get, uh, excitement that you get, even if you always do it right, it's, it's decreased, so it just gets more and more boring. So yet we don't have really the, the data, we don't have the, the uh, so we cannot make it uh, data dependent, but that will uh, happen later. You will see that. So, so it's very natural also to include a, um, a learning rate into that. Um, okay, so now because I want to put everything into the supervised learning framework, we like to work instead of rewards, we like to work with loss functions. So I just take uh, the loss function to be the negative uh, reward and the expected loss function is the negative expected reward. Uh, and so then that just becomes a minus, and there was a minus here and a plus there, so that just changes. So, so now it's the plus here and the, the minus is, is, is here. Um, so that's the, what we just extracted from the, from the neuroscience literature. 
okay, as, a, as a local updating formula. And of course, it doesn't help us anything for supervised learning because it's just on the level of individual weight. Um, but the, the key observation here is, okay, we know it cannot, based on the, cannot be based on the gradient, um, but it's based on the evaluation of the, the, the loss function itself, not on the gradient. And then we know that there's a big field in optimization that actually works exactly with optimization methods that only work on the, on the level of the loss, and they're called derivative-free methods because they don't use the gradient. So it's very natural now to somehow try to connect it to gradient-free gradient optimization. Yes, you would like to ask something? Mm -hmm. All of them, all of them will be updated. So the, the, the dopamine is released, and somehow the, the idea is that all of these neurons that are involved into the learning process get to uh, receive a bit of this dopamine, and that makes them to to to, to increase the, the weight change. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's very different, right? Because it just sees the, the, the loss and it doesn't see the gradient, right? So this is one number here, whereas normally the, the gradient is a vector, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a lot of information that also why it cannot do that, but here, so the, the only feedback it gets is this, this one number, which is the discounted uh, loss in the end. And that's the, the way it gets feedback from, the, uh, from, from how well it, it did. And that's what it can use in order to, to learn. Uh, a task. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, let's uh, just receive it at the time. And, uh, it was, oh yeah, okay, yeah, about half time. Okay, sorry, so now I want to give you a short intro to uh, derivative free optimization the way I probably would explain it in the classroom by just uh, one example. Okay, so um, what's the example? Well, we start with uh, what gradient descent is, probably some, everyone knows here. The gradient descent is we have a parameter theta, and then the next iterate, uh, we look uh, at the negative gradient, and we, we scale it with uh, the learning grade. And then there's uh, Stein's lemma. Stein's lemma says, okay, you take a random vector which uh, has a center, multivariate normal distribution, and it has uh, identity covariance multiplied with a, with a sigma squared, the variance sigma squared. So that means the, the entries of the vector are all uh, standard normal, uh, well, they're all uh, centered normal with variance sigma squared, and, and uh, they're independent of each other. Now, um, the Stein lemma, Stein's lemma says, well, you can look not at the gradient, but at the perturbed gradient. So where you perturb by a uh, and this a random vector, and an expectation, as up to this multiplicative factors, the, the variance sigma squared, an expectation that's the same as if you evaluate the loss, also not at theta k, but at the perturbed uh, theta k plus psi k. And that is now, again, this thing, right? On Here we have a vector, and this loss is, um, that's just a real number, right? It's just uh, a real number. And now we, we need a vector on the left, so we have to multiply it with this, with this perturbation vector. And an expectation that's the same, it's a, it's a trivial exercise to see that it's just integration by parts. There's nothing deep in, in that. But it allows us to go from something from the gradient to something only depending on the loss without the gradient. Um, okay, so if we, that only works in expectation, but we can of course say, um, this gradient over here, well, that should be, if we make the sigma squared small, so that should behave basically like the gradient of the theta k plus xi k. Um, and so an expectation, now we are here on the right-hand side, an expectation that's the same as the left-hand side if we multiply the sigma squared to the left-hand side, so we can take that as an estimator for the, uh, for the gradient at that point, and we just stick it in, and that gives us our gradient-free uh, optimization algorithm. So we just use the loss and we don't use the, the gradient of the loss. Um, so that's just for the normal distribution, and, um, but it can be extended, of course, to many, many other uh, distributions. That's just an example for, for a, a huge zoo of, of different uh, gradient-free uh, uh, optimization methods, but 
I, I hope the idea gets clear. What is a bit strange here is that you always have to have this exogenous uh, randomness that you sample on your on your computer. And the nice thing is, um, just a sort of spoiler, is for these biological networks is that uh, it is a, I mean, we, we link it to a zero order method and this exogenous randomness, is, it comes from the randomness of the, the, the underlying point processes. So this randomness is exactly the randomness that you need here. So it's a, because the, I mean, the brain cannot just sample new random variables. Or so, but this, this comes in through, this, uh, through the way these biological neural networks are structured. That, that uh, it just creates that thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay, so here's a vector, right? And so, so, so the expectation is taken over the randomness of this vector. And so if you, yeah, so, and so, so this all, I mean, these features are also thought of, of vectors. If you talk about down emotion, you think about a functional version of that. Uh, yeah, probably should also sort of exist if you want. So, but uh, since then, I mean, we have uh, later also an, we have a finite vector of parameters somehow, so, so we just have to discuss it on the level of, of vectors, of course. And that's what happens if you implement it, of course, you have always have to, to vectorize. Okay, so I said, no, that sounds great, right? Because we don't need a gradient, we want to compute a gradient, so we just uh, lost it it's simpler. So what, is that now a great method? No. Uh, the thing is that um, this method is has the disadvantage is an estimate of the gradient, but it's a very, very noisy estimate. So it's a hot gradient system. It's also an estimate of the gradient, but it's not as noisy as this estimate. Uh, so the, the, the disadvantage is really that the, the amount of noise that you have here, right? So the Stein lemma works on the level of expectation, so it doesn't tell us like, how noisy that is. The amount of noise that you add really scales with the number of parameters. So if the, the larger this uh, system is, the more parameters you have, the more the noisier it will get, and that's of course very detrimental to to, to the learning thing. And here's one way to, to see that, if you like, a bit of math. Um, so if we work out what what this object is, which uh, occurs here, this uh, uh, zero order increment, um, then uh, well, you can separate that if you take the least squares loss here, least squares loss, square squared Euclidean norm, then um, you see you can put uh, here the d minus one terms, and all what matters is the expectation, right? And these d minus one terms, they have mean zero, so they don't add anything to the expectation, they only add to the noise, and they make later the noise to scale something even like d squared or so, and so it's very, very bad. And only that one term, which is from the j component, that is really what contributes to the, to the expectation. That's, and that has to do with the fact that we store, instead of having a whole gradient, we have to everything in this one number, and that, that leads to the fact that somehow in this one number, we need a lot of terms that don't, if we look at the J's component, doesn't help us for the J's component, but it helps us for the all the other component. And but for the J's component, it just adds a lot of, of randomness to that. And that's, uh, that's the thing. So instead of a feedback, right, in this neural networks, instead of having a feedback, which is a whole vector, we just get one number. So there should be somehow a loss of, of order D or the uh, expected, right? And we know upper and lower bounds for that. And so we know that somehow there's nothing you can do so much about to avoid in the zero order methods uh, this large noise. Um, another thing is okay, so you can think well, zero order methods maybe they have a lot of noise, but then you can compute them much faster than uh, say gradient descent methods. But that's also not true if you want to look at these uh, feed forward networks, then they have a, a back propagation as a forward pass and a backward pass. So if you just evaluate the loss, you just need to do the forward pass. You don't need to do the backward pass. The forward pass and backward pass, they have the same computation and complexity. And so if you just do the forward one or the forward and the backward one, it's of the same order. So you don't gain in the rate of, of, of uh, in terms of these uh, algorithms. So there is no advantage in that respect as, as well. And so here's something I took from a book. Uh, it's called Introduction to the Relative Free Optimization. Normally, if you write a book about a topic, right, you try to advertise your, your method and so you're really proud of what you're doing. And so on. they say, well, really in the introduction already, well, um, whenever you can avoid these uh, zero order methods, they're just not, not great. Okay, so, so but, uh, disclaimer here. 
that's uh, the, the thing, right? If we link it, if we are able to link it to deriv derivative free optimization, we have somehow to reconcile these two uh, viewpoints that on one side, derivative free optimization is thought to not perform well, and on the other side, the brain, of course, and biological networks, they work well. So how can that be? Before I come to that, I just want now to, um, uh, in the last part of my talk, I want to connect the um, um, updating of individual weights to a global updating rule. Okay, so this is the, again the, the formula for the updating of individual weights. Um, we, uh, I think you, you remember that so it depends on all these uh, spike times, tau, t minus, t plus from the pre and postsynaptic neuron. And so what I want to do is I want to link it now to that thing. Okay, so it looks very different, and I will explain it a bit in a second. I, so I want to show um, that this is the, the object we have to study. That's the, the optimization method that we should study as a global optimization method, not on the level of individual neurons. So we start with that on the level of uh, neuron I connected to neuron J, and we end up in, in that thing. So this theta case, there are vectors that don't contain the the Ws, they contain the logs of the Ws, therefore they get a new name theta. So that turns out to be very, very natural rescaling, which you can do because the weights are uh, positive, so you can do log transform. Um, and then uh, this formula also has other things in it. So now we see it contains uh, the samples. So we took into supervised learning, and it has iteration steps k. And uh, in these loss functions now, we really have the loss based on the k sample, which has input xk and the uh, 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 response yk. And the um, expected loss, well, here we basically assume that there are take as proxy for the expected loss, the, the loss from the previous round, so everything is with a set of decay with the k minus one. So it basically says, well, if you, your expectation is what just happens in the previous round to you. And then it also has this. UK and the UK, they are. Uh, this is this exogenous randomness that you need for the zero order methods, and I will show you how that from this uh, description of uh, individual neurons here, where you don't see any U, right? How, how where does that come from, right? So, I, and but that comes also, I mean, um, um, through this um, uh, through this underlying um, structure of biological networks, and this UK occurs in a lot. Um, and it also occurs here um, as an outside uh, vector. So that's a vector here. And this is uh, so what I mean with that the UK is a vector, and e to the minus UK is just e to the minus applied component wise to the entries of the UK vector. Good. That sounds uh, a bit of far stretch. So, how do we get there? And I have structured this. Um, I just want to show you the, like, the, the main steps, and I have structured this into four main steps. Uh, how we come from this uh, individual updating to the to the global updating rule. Um, okay, first step is the first step, and all these steps they come with underlying assumptions that I try to highlight. And so we make strong assumptions. There's no no doubt or that, about that. So the first is, uh, step is to write this in, uh, updating formula here um, as a as a iterative in an iterative form. Okay, so what does it mean? So we get to see uh, data. And every round, as an STD and so how to and descent, you get to see a new sample, a new uh, input, and then you have to make your prediction on the output. And um, what is known is that um, if you see something, you have something to classify that, then um, individual neurons, so the, this process is really, really fast. Okay, so that's also why we really need to look. I mean, these weight models that average over time, they are too slow to explain anything about learning. So you really have to look into this lifetime dependent plasticity to explain that. And then typically like then the amount of spikes of neurons uh, until the decision is made is maybe two or three or 10 or, or zero or sorry, that's, but it's really small. I mean, the, the few spikes until um, the prediction is done by the, by the biological network. And so what we do here basically was in order to synchronize the number of spikes and the number of samples, we, we say, okay, we assume that for every neuron, there's exactly one spike occurring in the case sample, okay? So you get to see one sample, every biological neuron can make one spike, and then the prediction is done, okay? So that synchronizes the number of updates and the number of samples, and that makes our life easier. It's not that it's very realistic, but it's of the order, I think it's right. So, so that means we then can write these 
wait that the, the, the case updates and that the case samples all synchronize. And then we can rewrite it into that into this form where everything is now K dependent. And we have you see we have these predicted responses and the, the, the two responses in here. Okay, that's nice. Now the next step in this derivation is um, we want to get the, somehow the randomness out of the spike time structure. And so what we do is all the arguments is as follows. One postsynaptic neuron receives input from about a thousand presynaptic neurons. That means the influence of an individual presynaptic neuron on the postsynaptic neuron is very, very small, right? So it's, it's just not really, I mean, if it's just one, then you cannot do anything. It's really that they, they, there's a lot of things going on at the same time. If the influence is very small, well, we, what we can say is assume that actually the, the moment the spike times of the presynaptic neuron are completely independent of the spike times of the postsynaptic neuron. It just happens maybe at the early stage of learning, at least it just happens at, at random times. And then between two spike times of the postsynaptic neuron, the a specific presynaptic neuron has a uniform distribution of a spike to occur between that, um, the, the two postsynaptic ones. Okay, so that means now what we can say is this thing here, this object, uh, under this assumption, it's, uh, it's actually a uniform distribution. Okay, so that means, uh, and, and it's not true. I mean, there's, for instance, um, there are states in learning, um, for instance, if during an epileptic attack or so, then where, where all these neurons are synchronized and so on, then it's not true. But uh, maybe at a certain, I mean, that's also not something where you where you learn a lot or so, right? So, so that there, there are, of course, states where, it's not, where this assumption is violated. But I think it's still a good proxy to, to start with and to say, okay, so there's so many, then their individual contribution is small. So that's basically you think about uh, unrelated, and so that gives you uniform randomness over conditions over um, the spike times of the postsynaptic neurons. So that means if we assume that, we can now, before, you know, we had these, these difference of the spike times in here, and now we can put in here these, these uniform random variables in here and here. Okay, so we have resolved these difference of the spike times by just something uh, uniformly distributed. Uh, that's step two. Now step three is about um, uh, the loss functions. And so whenever you want to also do the gradient descent methods, um, gradient descent based methods, you, you need to understand how does the, the loss function depend on the parameters, right? Otherwise you cannot do any, say anything about gradient descent that, that you take uh, with respect to the parameters. So what we have to understand here is in such a biological network, there's a prediction that's made based on the outcome of the biological network, but how does the YK head depend on the, on the parameters of the biological network? Okay, so let's try to work that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we take the condition here on that, yeah, in detail, so that's a bit uh, weird, sorry, sorry. Uh, in, uh, well, yeah, yeah, so, so you would. Well, you can think about this in the next layer, you know, two layer thing. It's much, much more synchronized uh, than in the previous layer. So, so that um, it, it, it spikes at much, much more regular times, and therefore it makes uh, maybe sense to take it fixed here. And that, uh, and that. Um, well, if you if you can measure the, the brain activity or so, so you, in principle, I think you could you could uh, look at it. Yeah. So, so sometimes they do that with monkeys with the brain opens a certain and they can can see how the these spike trends and so look like so. Um, okay, so the, the next step is on how the prediction depends on uh, on the parameters. And the interesting thing is that it uh, depends on the parameters only through these parameters multiplied by these e to the minus, and then there's also the difference between the uh, presynaptic and postsynaptic spike time. And that has to do with the fact, well, so what does it remember from the from the past in the network, right? From the from the past layer, all what it remembers is the um, the, the information of the future, right? That, that it sends to, to to later layers and other neurons in the in the biological network is, is in the spike times. Okay, so that's all all the information it has for for its descendants. And so the spike times itself, if we go back to this explanation here, the spike times they depend not on the parameters, but they depend on the, I mean, even here it's better to see that, it depends on the parameter times the potential at, at that moment, okay? So they don't, there's always these products that occur and they determine the spike times and everything else about the parameters is forgotten later. That means 
Um, actually, what they do is they depend on, on these products of uh, the parameter times, the, uh, the distance of the spike times. We already assumed that they are uniformly distributed, and it's the same uniform distribution that also occurred in here. And so that means we can write that in such a form. Okay, so, it's, uh, uh, so there's also this vector uh, notation where we just um, multiply two vectors uh, component-wise. Um, okay, and so uh, now we have resolved here is again the, the that was before the y k hat the predicted value, and now we somehow we of course we might have to reparameterize for the losses, but we know it depends on these products. It depends on the uh, case sample, uh, of course, as well. And what is very natural is now to do instead of these W case to look at uh, the, the log W case, right? So, and then you, because then everything goes into the exponent and it becomes a theta K plus U K instead of these, these weird products over here. It's exactly what we do here. In the final step in this reduction scheme is we take the, the vector which contains all these theta IJs and the theta IJs are the logs of the weights. If you do that, then of course you have to. This loss is not exactly the loss from before. It just is up to some reparameterization, but then only depends on the on the, the entry-wise sum of the vectors and not on these weird weird objects over here, right? So that um, uh, just appears, and then we can write everything in the vector notation and all these things here. Uh, and in the vector notation, it looks like e to the minus u. Okay, and that's the that's the thing we have to. The study and it already uses a lot. Of, first of all, it comes with a lot of assumptions and so on. Um, but it uses a lot of, already of the structure of the biological networks. For instance, is what I'm highlighted before. This exogenous randomness uh, in the zero order method that is here that comes basically through the through the spike chain structure. So what we can do here is we can now look at this optimization method and just unrelated to to biological networks and just study that for, for our favorite, I don't know, strongly convex problem or whatever we want to do. Um, and I, at the end, yeah, so I have one, one result for you um, that gives a bit of uh, what, whether that is a good uh, um, um, theorem or a good uh, optimization method or not. Well, this result, and then I basically stop, this result tells us, okay, we now create some flotation problem. Biological networks they cannot they cannot do gradient descent. But this result tells us that an expectation it actually does gradient descent up to some um, up to some perturbation in here. Okay, so if we would not have this UK here, if you maybe also forget about this factor, then what you see basically if we, this is the expectation here, right? If I take expectation, um, then um, in expectation, it is something like a gradient descent method. And again, like what is also in the Stein's lemma, and so we have this perturbation, and not by the normal distribution here, but by the uniform distribution. And having it by the uniform distribution, that gives us here this extra factor, what, what I have on over here, and just the change of distribution. It's a sort of beta type distribution. You can basically forget it. It's not, not really important. You also could make a UK tilde out here and forget it also, but it's, that's not really the, the issue. So the, the key message of this result is, okay, local um, uh, um, um, local updating rules, they cannot do gradient descent, but an expectation they can do gradient descent. The problem is the, the large noise, and that's something I mentioned also highlighted before. Zero order methods are known to have large noise. The question is how can that now work um, here in, in such a setup? Is there something in the derivation of the optimization method? Or maybe there are problems where actually also these zero order methods can perform quite quite well and even optimal in an optimal way. Okay, and with that, I, so I had one slide more about other approaches. Uh, I, I think I have to skip that. I just want to come to my summary slide. And then I have a few minutes of questions for questions. Thank you very much for attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so you said that the document is the uh, worst for the new ones, but it's not the only neurotransmitter that exists. As I understand it, so like, what are the other neurotransmitters functions? Like, do they also simulate like updates, or, or what, what do they do? Ah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so this is um, this formula here is for uh, excitatory neurons, and uh, for inhibitory neurons, there are many different versions. Um, it depends on the neurotransmitter. So I am, and um, I have excluded these uh, from from the analysis. I, I don't know what to do. They, it's important when you have this ratio of 80% excitatory and 20% uh, inhibitory neurons, and so on. People say it's important for the learning. And I've also ignored that at, at that level. So because and that's still one of the reasons is that there are no good uh, formulas on how these inhibitory neurons uh, change the weights based on on, on the neuron transmitter sneakers. Yeah. So for that, yeah, I, I think it's just talked to someone yesterday here. It's um, not even clear what the role is of that we have several neuron transmitters in the brain, right? So, um, um, but I think this formula yeah, is also if you talk to experts and they say, well, this is true for certain brain regions where people have tested that, or it's a good proxy, but there might be other brain regions that also learn with other formulas. So, but of course, then, then it becomes endless, right? So, so I think a good way is one has to make somehow choices because otherwise you don't get anywhere, right? So, so therefore, I think we make all these sorts of choices and try now rather to look at the into the optimization methods instead of trying to to model all sorts of different brain regions and see what the discrepancies are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, may I ask you if there is some unique memory mechanism that we can use with these, with these type of neural networks? And if we can use some already developed approaches for memory or attention mechanisms that we have in deep neural networks? Uh, can you repeat it? So you want to? Yeah, like, uh, do we have some specific uh, memory mechanism, for example, like mm -hmm. RNNs or LTMs that we have in the usual neural networks? But is there some specific exactly to this memory mechanism? Okay, I, okay, I, I don't think it uh, can answer this question. I think I are really used to look into the supervised learning framework, um, and I people like to ask about this. What what does it memorize? And so even like for supervised learning and so that's something also from the statistical theory. You don't really get out what what individual weights do and what it what it really memorizes or so. Uh, it's all what you can prove in the end that what comes out is somehow a good thing for for reconstructing the the target function. But because it's a black box somehow, this I think there's no tools that we have and that that can tell us something about memorization or so. And um, yeah. For, for all these attention type mechanisms, I can also not say anything, uh, I think, at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so at the end, your equation for the update rule mm -hmm. for theta, mm -hmm. um, it depended on the rate of change of L, the loss function. Mm -hmm. uh, so is, is that biologically plausible? Because if the, the feedback is on dopamine and dopamine's corresponding to the difference between the, uh, the, the result and the expected results, it doesn't have a store of the rate of change of dopamine. Uh, so, so you're wondering about the, the minus thing here? Mm. Yeah, so, so that is already incorporating. So that is, that is the loss here. And what we take here just for the presentation is that the, the, the previous one is the, the somehow the anticipate let's let's call it the anticipated uh, loss. Um, so we take the, the previous round as anticipated loss. So and what it so so that is the, the difference is somehow the effective the effective loss actually. And I, I forgot maybe one thing, which is why is that a good thing from the optimization method? I, I think it's just really, I mean, in the neuroscience literature, they say it has to be exactly like that, and these models, because otherwise it's not going to, to, to work. They, they, they observe that as well. And for the neuroscience, uh, for the optimization, having the difference actually it helps um, because I said, well, the, the noise in the zero order method that scales with the, with the D. Um, but if you subtract it, it, it somehow gives you a, a square root of d. Like it's only as a square root of d because the first order terms that dominate that thing that, that they drop out, and so, 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 so it becomes less bad if you have the, the difference that the, 
with the loss before you can you can see that. So so there is some some gain here. I think these methods just also two points zero order methods where you, where you use two points and they're also known that they, they gain a bit in the in the dependence on the D of the noise. That exactly happens here as well with the difference. Um, and um, so, so it's, it's much better than the, the one. If, you, if we would not have that here, it would be much worse in terms of optimization performance. Yeah. Yeah. And it's biologically plausible, yeah. yeah. Okay. Basically, the loss at time k minus one is the expected loss at time k. Exactly, yeah. Okay. That's the thing, yeah. Yeah. You could also take somehow something over the past, so it's some sort of symmetric sum, like what you have in reinforcement learning or so. But here, for simplicity, I think we just take that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, more questions? There was also something with the inputs earlier, and so you, now you see that probably here in this derivation, you don't have to to, to really use that. It, it does not, at the moment, if you want to, to, to use that for biological networks, I think you would need to know where these XKs come from and so on, what they are. But if you want to use this optimization outside of the biological context, say for a strongly convex problem, so you don't need to, to, to know how the conversion is from the input. You can maybe say the input, such as your, your images and the responses, are the, whether it's a cat or a dog or so, so then you don't have to clarify that. So that's not a part of this derivation, really, on, on the input. It's much more on what happens within the biological network and not how the, how the input is decoded and also not how the, how the uh, reward or so is computed. That's also not important to know here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, no more questions. Okay, so let's thank Johannes again.